Many New York City voters will head to the polls four times this year. There was that presidential primary in April, and there will be state legislative primaries in September, and then the big general election in November. Yesterday was the day for federal primaries, which meant seven contests in New York City's congressional districts. Three of those races involved Brooklyn, and we're pleased to have two of the candidates from those contests here to talk with us about what the takeaways are from their campaigns. They are Jeff Curzon, one of the two men who challenged Representative Nydia Velasquez in the 7th District, and Oliver Rosenberg, who contested Representative Gerald Nadler's incumbency in the 10th. Thank you both so much for coming on the show today. And we're also very pleased to have back a regular BK Live guest, an old hat, Stephen Witt Thank from you. Kings County Politics. Uh, I meant old in the best possible sense, to help <laughs> us uh, sort out what all yesterday's races mean and what's coming next. Thanks for being on again, Stephen. Thank you. So, Thank you. gentlemen, the race is over, the primary race is over. What is the main thing you're feeling today? I'm feeling good. Uh, you know, it's my first race. Uh, you know, I mean, it was certainly a wild experience running for office. Uh, it's very difficult to go up against an incumbent who hasn't been opposed in a primary in 20 years. Certainly, uh, I went up against, I mean, he brought in Obama for robocalls, uh, so it was quite a challenge. But I made great headway, and uh, I feel very good about the whole experience. Jeff, what about you? Relief, sadness, and combination? Um, well, I'm still, I think, digesting because um, I guess I ran in 2014, and my message then was pretty much the same as it was for this cycle, is that Congress should be working for the people rather than the big banks and the big corporations. And I guess I'm not surprised by the result, um, because in 2014, only 4% of Democrats in the district voted. This cycle, um, closer to 7% voted. And uh, that, that's encouraging that the number went up. Um, there was a third candidate, Young Min Lee, who ran. And I think he um, really wanted to represent <clears throat> the people in the district and be their uh, public servant. And you know, he conveyed a sense of honesty and um, willingness to work hard. So he got a, he got a lot of votes. Um, and you know, when looking at the numbers, I'm particularly proud of uh, all the volunteers that helped on my campaign and all the people who voted. Um, I, I just spent $5,000 of my own money on this race. So um, I can claim a victory on, on the uh, dollar per vote um, average, <laughs> average dollar per vote, which, which I think was around $3 for me. And Congresswoman Velasquez, I think she won not re-election, because that will happen in the fall, but renomination with about 62 percent of the vote, which is mm -hmm. relatively low for an incumbent in a primary. When you look at the results of your race, how do they match your, I'm, I'm sure not your hopes, but your expectations going in? Uh, sure. Well, uh, you know, a, a huge part of my messaging was that over 60 percent of the district is now 45 years old. And in a lot of our conversations with them, people feel that the Democratic establishment is not listening to their dilemma. The problem is it's hard to get young people to go out and vote. And so, like what he was saying, it's a problem that there was still very low voter turnout uh, overall. And uh, when you go up against the machinery, um, they, they have just a much better ability to crank out the votes. Stephen, you obviously were looking at all these races. Correct. Uh, morning after, what jumps out at you? Is anything surprising, unexpected, remarkable? I think that the, the one good thing that was really good to see was that there was races. And in, in Democratic politics in Brooklyn, there's such a logjam, it's sort of like the odds are stacked against you. To begin with, it's a one-party town, and it, it was good. I thought Oliver would actually do a little bit better. Um, however, it it was really tough going up against Jerry Nadler and the robocalls from Obama, and he's he's been in the game a long time. I think so far as Nidia's campaign, I expected young men to do that well. He's Chinese American. And the district includes both Manhattan's Chinatown and Brooklyn's Chinatown in Sunset Park. And I think Nidia hasn't really addressed the concerns of the Asian American community. So, I, and, and it's good to see Jeff, who is more like a Sanders kind of Democrat, or, you know, more of a, a Democratic reformer. And I think that, you know, it's good. It's good to open up the politics of Brooklyn. And that's part of what Kings County politics, what the mission is, is to open up the process and to give media to the process, you know, not so much just to be to go along with the incumbent, but to give some of the challengers a little play. And 
you know, it's good for democracy. So, um, Jeff, what was your purpose in running? Was it to, you know, uh, did you feel you were on a mission? Were you trying to make a statement? Were you trying to well, win? What was the... I, I mean, in a way, it's a bit selfish because I'm, I'm a citizen and I'm not happy with the way things are going in our country. So, I've spoken to a lot of people and there's a lot of other people who are not happy with the way things are going. We have 30% um, of kids in our district who are growing up in poverty. Uh, we have people in a democratic society that are not voting in elections. Or if they're trying to vote, they're being denied the right to vote um, because of our closed primaries and um, arcane rules that are designed to prevent people from switching parties. And, uh, you know, so I get the sense as an American citizen that something is wrong and unhealthy with our democracy. And I can look at it from the perspective of somebody who's studied and worked abroad and sort of I have an identity of myself as an American by being around a lot of non-Americans, non-U.S. citizens. And so, um, you know, I would like to see a Congress that is rebuilding the middle class, is uh, helping the economy from the bottom up rather than the top down. And, you know, when the incumbent um, takes the donations from Wall Street PACs or corporate PACs and then votes for things like the repeal of Glass-Steagall or uh, the bank bailouts of $700 billion, um, there's a fundamental distrust in the, um, in essence, the accountability of government to represent the people. And I get the sense that our United States Congress is representing big business and corporate America and the big banks. And I think a lot of people agree with that. Um, you know, I've talked with everyone from Sunset Park to Brooklyn Heights to, to Woodhaven. And, um, you know, I think that it's going, going to take time to get campaign finance reform. Um, but we've achieved it at the local level in New York. And so, so some frustrations there uh, that led you to run. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the race itself? Do you feel you were treated unfairly? What about the process was sort of stacked against you as a non-incumbent? What's your take on, you know, how fair the, the play was? Well, uh, first of all, the fact that we have so many different election days in one year, uh, the fact that why do we have congressional primaries you know, on June 28th? It's a huge cost to our local government to have to have so many election days. I mean, and it, it, it's certainly something that, that is, is meant to keep the incumbents in power. Uh, very few people vote in June. It gives us less time. It used to be congressional primaries were in September. That would have given us more time to prepare. Uh, so uh, I definitely feel that there is something very much stacked against um, many organizations, uh, many people uh, of influence who very much resonated with what I had to say about the Iran deal or, or some of my other messages about young people and the local economy. They, they're just so afraid of going up against an entrenched incumbent who's been there for 24 years that people are like, well, I hope you win, but, and so it, it, it is very difficult, but I, I'm very happy to say that after 20 years of no Democratic primary in the district, we have like unopened that lock and it won't be 20 more years. Stephen, that raises kind of two process questions. One is, why do we have a primary in June now? It seems a bizarre time to have one. And two, and these guys could talk about it too, that the shape of these districts, looking at the map yesterday to remind me, is, is crazy. The one you ran in runs from yeah. the west side. Yeah. Down Very Brooklyn, yours crosses the river too, kind of the edge of Brooklyn. Um, do those districts make any sense? Well, I think, first of all, New York is sadly in need of election reform. I mean, it's it, we're behind state, like backward states, supposedly backward states like Florida or, you know, there should be open primaries. There's no reason in the world why they shouldn't have the primary on the same day the state primary is. Uh, it, it, would, it would, you know, create more interest. I think people get a uh, voter shock or like ticket shock because they're voting so much they're not even sure what they're voting for. I congratulate both these candidates for taking a shot at it. I think the deck, you know, was stacked against them. I think there should be open primaries. So far as gerrymandering, that's uh, more in, in Jerry Nadler's district, I think, than Nidia's. Because uh, I, how many people are per congressional district, is it? It's uh, around 730,000. Right. So if it's 730,000, I could kind of see Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan 
kind of together. It's a little bit, when you look at the map, it's a little more contiguous, whereas uh, Congressman Nadler's district is, you know, it narrows down a little cutaway section from from Red Hook into Borough Park, and it, you know, I have no idea how that was done. Oliver, I'm curious. Um, raising money is something people talk about as being one of the most horrible aspects of running. And you <laughs> self-financed at, uh, at a modest level, but I take it you, you raised money. What was that like, asking people for cash? Uh, it's actually very difficult, and uh, my race was only, I only started running the first week of March, so I would say I mostly self-financed this campaign. I mean, I had some friends and family, uh, and that's difficult, but I would say well over 80% came from my own. So let's talk policy for a second. If you had won yesterday and won again in November, you're elected to Congress, what would your first bill have been? It would be a, a grassroots democracy act. Um, there's already been one introduced um, that I would like to see some revisions to, but uh, Rep. Sarbanes from Maryland has introduced a bill, and there's a lot of organizations that say that before, and, and I'm inspired by um, Lawrence Lessig, who's a Harvard Law professor and a leader in the campaign finance reform, reform movement. We can't fix problems with gun control, with the environment, with housing, with infrastructure, uh, until we fix the problem with money and politics. And, and you, what would your first priority have been? It would have been uh, pushing for reform at the Federal Reserve, specifically the fact that they have spent so much money in bailing out Wall Street, yet now they have almost two trillion in excess capital. There's plenty of money there for them to be directly lending to small businesses. Uh, small businesses are the engine of our economy. Last year, slowest amount of small businesses created in 30 years. Uh, Main Street is in need of a bailout. Uh, so we'll be calling for that. Speaking of the future, Stephen, next up are these legislative primaries uh, in September. Any races in Brooklyn on the radar screen that you think might be interested? Several of the 55th in Brownsville, Latrice Walker and Darlene Mealy should be a good one. Uh, I, in I, 56th, I think, or 57th in Bed-Stuy, uh, Nett Robinson stepped down, so it will be Tremaine Wright against uh, Karen Cherry is a good one. Uh, the state Senate in Canarsie should be interesting between uh, Senator Bersad and Mercedes uh, uh, Narcisse. And uh, one or two others, I just can't. Oh, the, the Coney Island, which is Coney Island and Bay Ridge together. I think it's the 46, sometimes I get the assembly, I don't know. Oh, we it, all do. It's a 46th yeah. <laughs> district, and that's between Pam Harris and Kate Kuko, and it's a real battle between Coney Island and Bay Ridge. Talk about gerrymandered. That's a very strange district to gerrymander. It's so some good races coming up. One thing that has always, I've always been curious about as someone who's covered politics but not been part of it is, what's the phone call like when you, when you call your opponent to concede, to congratulate them? Um, I'm assuming you both made that phone call. Can you I'm, I'm laughing because... Um, is it as awkward as one imagines it would be? Well, I'm laughing because it's awkward. Also, you know, I called up uh, the air side and then the congressman refused to take the call. So it was just a campaign manager that I spoke to. Oh, jeez. So, yeah. Did you uh, attempt to make a phone call? Well? Um, well, I will um, be happy to speak with Representative Velasquez at any time. And I challenged her to a debate, and I never heard back. Um, I sent out a tweet last night after my victory party um, around 1 a.m., congratulating her on her success and wishing her well in the future. And also Young Min Lee, because it's, um, you know, I think like Oliver is very brave. Um, Pete Linder from District 12. It, it's it's very hard to be a candidate, and I, I want to encourage other people to run. and. Um, will, and you also, run, will you run again? Uh, I don't know, but um, you know, I'll certainly be advocating for the issues that I was um, advocating on this campaign going forward. And um, you know, I hope. <clears throat> Actually, I ran into uh, Representative Velasquez yesterday on Grand Street near the um, the co-ops uh, near the East River, and uh, we were both trying to talk to voters at the same time. And um, you know, I said, you know, you have the advantage as the incumbent, and I said also. You know, our system of campaign finance, ref um, our system of campaign finance is really messed up. And she said, I know. So that was um, a victory for me that <laughs> she's willing to listen. And I hope that she'll become uh, a reformer in, in, um, in the way that she manages her future campaigns and what she advocates for in Congress. You referred either in the hallway or, or here on air to this being your first race. Does that mean there's, there's more to come? 
Uh, I think so. We'll see. You know, I'm leaving it open. Uh, I think this is the beginning of a career, but we, you know, I'll, I'll reassess my options. Time goes by. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming, for making democracy happen in Brooklyn and elsewhere in the city. And maybe we'll have you on in, uh, I guess, 2018 to talk about those races.